from the book, uh, this, this one, Delicious Foods. Uh, I'll try not to set it up too much, but sometimes I feel like the setting up of the book takes more time than the actual reading. It's like I set it up for like five minutes and then I read a paragraph. Um, let's see. I think the passage is on page 72. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Delicious Foods is a, a story of a mother and her son who get embroiled in a kind of debt slavery scam. Um, the sort of which has actually taken place um, mostly in Florida, um, in which a uh, corrupt farm will <clears throat> send a van of some kind to an urban area looking for people they think will not be missed, like drug addicts, prostitutes, and wh whoever. Whoever might be interested in a sort of agricultural job, um, they tell them all sorts of, you know, fancy things about how great it's going to be, and then, you know, once they get there, they gradually discover that they're slaves for all intents and purposes. You know, they, they're told that they owe a lot of money for the bride, and then for the accommodations, and then, you know, there's a company store where they jack up the prices. Anyway. Um, Darlene Hardison is the, uh, is the, the mother and um, she winds up at this place. I, I think I'm going to read just for a little bit uh, of this chapter called We Name the Goat, which is about uh, around the time that Darlene shows up at uh, the farm, which is called Delicious Foods. And this chapter is written in the, uh, the voice of a character named Scotty, who I think um, Rachel just spilled the beans about. Mm -hmm. um, Scotty is, for all intents and purposes, the voice of crack cocaine um, body. This chick standing by that navy blue mon minibus parked at the side of the road seemed okay to Darlene. Better than okay. Firstly, the woman had on a clean blouse in a multicolored African triangle pattern, almost like a stained glass window. Only a couple holes in that shirt. Same with them acid wash jeans and them skippies on her feet. The minibus seemed sort of new, mostly. Was no scratches or dents you could see under the white light in front of the party fool, the next lot over from the one where Darlene just lost three teeth. The minibus ties was all waxy shiny, the hubcaps too. The sliding door slid open smooth and you could smell the plasticky new car odor inside even from a couple feet away. Them windows be shining and them seats looked like it, they could actually bounce. And when Darlene lay sideways around the woman and peeked inside, she could tell the brothers in the back was comfortable. The lady, said her name Jackie, does started in like some direct marketing TV huckster, talking fast about this place and this job that sounded real good, and that Darlene and I should go with her. A wet jerry curl went sprawling on her head, then it gone partway down the back of her neck, with the hairpins pushing the sides above her ears for that business casual look. Darlene ain't concentrated on nothing, Jackie said, though, because she said more than need be, the way people do when they already decided that you're going to turn down their pitch. While we listening, Darlene had to plant her feet to keep from shouting with joy. Even all that dry, even with all that dry blood caked up in her nose and gums and them scratched up knees. Sound like this lady had a job they want to give her without no interview or nothing. Hard work, but good work. No more trying to sell her body and getting stabbed. Or <laughs> this is it refers to another earlier scene. Or having to watch no shame loving Cajun get busy with no melon. <laughs> Now you have to buy the book. <laughs> Jackie said, the company's associates do agricultural work, harvesting a wide variety of fruits, vegetables, and legumes. She actually said them actual phrases like it's out of a book she ain't ever finished reading herself. Darlene grown up doing that shit in the first place, so she got lonely for her childhood. On this job, she gonna be picking fruits and vegetables like she an innocent little girl again. Jackie also made the farm sound like the kind of place where Darlene and I could go together and wouldn't nobody stop us from hanging out and doing our thing. And that seemed so perfect, we wondered if we might have made it up ourselves. An image come up in Darlene's mind of a bodacious ass horn of plenty that had all kind of green and red peppers and shit spilling out, bananas and carrots and grapes and whatnot, and everything be cold, crispy, 
fresh and wet with morning dew on account of just being picked. In her head, somebody snapped a carrot and they sprayed a little bit of mist up into the air. Darlene said to me, see, Scotty, the book works. I put positivity and love out on my antenna, and the universe sent it back to bless me. Jackie said, three-star accommodations. She said, Olympic-sized swimming pool. She said, recreation activities, competitive salary, vacation. Then she showed Darlene a picture of some condo-type complex with a motherfucking kidney-shaped pool smack dab in the center. Then Jackie topped it off with benefits, health care. We got a dentist that could help out with any problems you might have, Jackie said, looking at Darlene's mouth, as well as daycare. To be honest, she said, the pay ain't super high, but we offer our workers a salary above minimum wage, the competitive rate in the field. Darlene appreciated the honesty. Even better than getting a high salary was the feeling that you're working with people you could respect, who told your ass the truth, motherfuckers you could communicate with. This here felt like the first luck Darlene had touched in the whole six years since she lost her husband, Nat. Above minimum wage. She thought she could reach up to that luck and stroke it, and the luck would go <laughs> Now, Jackie talked a long stream. You couldn't dip in your damn toe. Girl had heart-shaped lips with brick-colored lip gloss slathered on them, and the edges were shining, sexy red plums. Her tongue always going somewhere as when she talked. Sometimes she licked the corner of her mouth to keep it from getting dried out from all that talking. Jackie, 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 Darlene said every so often trying to butt in to let her know how much she on board with it already, how much on board with it she already was. Jackie eyes still ain't said nothing. They could only say the deal, the great deal, the wonderfulness of the deal. She acted jittery and I knew why. I recognized her as a May I call my son, Darlene asked. Sometime Eddie say that Darlene didn't ever care about him, especially when it comes to the particular moment we talk about now, but she ain't never stopped trying to make sure she could get in touch. Eddie probably thought his mom loved his dad more than him, and that might have been true, but she thought about Eddie all the time. Loves a mother to start with, so when some of the bitches start fighting over who loves who more and trying to say that this action you've done today got to line up with that verbal statement from yesterday about how much you love somebody and they pull out their loveometers and start measuring shit out to infinity, I get pissed. Me, I think people could love me or somebody like me and still show their obligations to the other people in their life as number two and three and four and so on down the line and it ain't no thing. When Darlene asked about calling her son, Jackie got activated again. Of course you could call your son, she said. We'll let you use the phone when we get there, free of charge. Jackie be showing off the open door of the minibus with her hand like, like she know the price is right, and Darlene figured she could hear the sucking of pipes and popping of rocks in there. The darkness and the tinted windows had kept her from seeing much, and in them days, she always hearing rocks in the back of everything, every, anyhow. I said to Darlene, I know these folks. I approve. Honey, get the fuck in before the people out in them bushes behind the party fool who be listening to everything we say find out about this terrific opportunity and try to come with us. Darlene said yes and jumped over to the minibus without no reservations whatsoever. And when she done that, she noticed a plush carpet on the minibus floor, a carpet laid out in front of us on the road to prosperity. Darlene hesitated on account of she ain't know if she could get up into the van. Her eyes rolled into her head and she swooned, about to fall. She gripped the footrest to get a balance and flopped onto the floor of the van next to the center seat. Her hand went swoosh over the beige shag, and she remembered being a child and petting a sheep her father had named Luther. At the wheel, with just the front seat overhead light on, a red-eyed brother be sucking the last from a juice box, making a racket. When he got done, he pushed the box through the slit in the window out onto the road, and a breeze blew it into the center lane, and a passing semi done crushed that shit flat. Jackie laughed, and the driver looked around and gave a broad smile without opening his mouth. Four others sitting in the rest of them seats, all of them hunched over shadows made by the headlights coming from the opposite side of the road. Red Eye turned the ignition, the door closed, and they was on their way. Darlene found herself a seat and looked at Jackie. I grew up on a farm, Darlene said. Did you now? That's sure going to come in handy. What time is it? I need to call my son, okay? Okie dokie. How far is it from Houston? Just up the road here, an hour or so. That close? Okay. 
Dolly had seen a bunch of dark shapes, three in the very back seat and one in the front of that, passing around a little red light. The one in front took it in his palm, and she bugged out when she saw that pipe. The man put it up to his face, and the light began brighter as he sucked it in, and the pipe started fizzing that fizz that gave Darlene an orgasm of hope. She loved the sound of my voice. You feel like lighting up. Go on ahead now. This ain't company time, Jackie said, and giggled. Darlene nearly had a conniption. You don't mind, she asked. Jackie talked all calm and businessy. This company really takes care of their workers. We don't judge. Seriously? She asked Jackie. Seemed to Darlene, someone should nominate them for the best employer the world has ever known. <laughs> Seriously, Jackie said. Words, said one of the brothers in the back. What's the hitch? Darlene asked. The hitch is that there ain't no hitch. Jackpot. One of the brothers passed the pipe up front and Darlene sucked it like it's a pacifier. She thinking how we could spend time together, but also gonna have real, honest to God work at a place where they understand our relationship and don't try to stop it or take her, make her stay away from me. Too good. This is an incredible opportunity, Dr. Gush. She felt like she missed America taking her first walk with that motherfucking tiara on, carrying her roses in her arms and waving and crying. I rushed into the few doubting and unbelieving parts left in Darlene's mind, and I shouted, Baby girl, surrender to yes! Say yes to good feelings! Say yes to pleasure! Fuck pain! All that damn pain, leave it behind you! Ain't that what, what the books say to do? Good thing I didn't find no resistance up in her mind, because what I wanted, to, I wanted to go to that farm just as bad. Now, I get that when somebody, now I get that when somebody walk up to your house and offer you heaven on earth, the delivery truck don't usually be idling at the, at the curb. That goes extra specially in Texas. But we couldn't think on that. Darlene already had way too much shit not to be thinking about. Once the minibus got moving, Jackie passed the recruits a clipboard and a pen, like when you get in a job job, and she goes, this is the contract. Somebody already done folded that sucker over to the last page and put a bright yellow tag in the place where you're supposed to sign. A beefy brother with giant teeth and idiot eyes named of T.T. squinted at the page and scribbled on the signature line. Sirius B, who are intense, silent types sitting across the aisle, took the contract out from under the clip, folded to the first page, and held it like he wanted to read that shit in a street lamp light they whizzed through. Jackie lent him into his personal space and said, Don't sweat it, bro, you just signed. Before she seen what anybody else done, Darlene slipped that pen out that clip and joyfully wrote, Darlene Hardison, on the, right on the line. A screen rolled down over her world that showed a sparkling future of joy, just like the book told her she gonna get by asking and believing that she gonna receive. Okay, I'll stop there. Uh, a couple things I was thinking about last minute just now is that uh, this book is a novel, not a documentary, and yet there is really some documentary material in it. And um, I was wondering, like, what are, what are the differences between what can happen in a novel in terms of activation or possibility versus a documentary? There's, you know, there's some documentaries on, on uh, contemporary slavery out now and how do they sort of operate differently with their audience? And yeah, I mean, what I was hoping for was that, you know, I mean, there's a lot of nonfiction material out about this subject, but I felt like there was, I couldn't think of anything that had been written in a fictional context about this kind of thing. And I think that, you know, one of the things that we get from um, novels is a, is a kind of emotional history of what happened, right? It's, you know, if you look at novels of the past, you can kind of suss out in some respects, like what the, what the more is of the day. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's actually really, it's pretty obvious if you're black, right? You read all these old writers and you're like, oh, they were racists. <laughs> <laughs> like, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, look, here, the long came. What I was hoping for is that, you know, moving into this medium would, would not only create an emotional history for this kind of thing and to kind of make it exist in the world in a way that it hadn't before, mm -hmm. but I know that there are different audiences for those two things and that they're pretty separate. I mean, I would think, yeah. I had in the back of my mind this idea that, oh, well, everybody must know about it because there are all these you know, non-fiction books about it, but it's actually turned out to be quite the opposite. Like, yeah. very few people 
people seem to know that this particular kind of thing is going on. It's not exactly the norm, and it's not, um, but I think it, it's enough, it has enough of the elements of the kind of labor abuse that goes on in the normal way, you know, kind of the sort right. of normalized. The company store, yeah. the sort of beatings. Yeah, <laughs> right. that, that, you know, that it's, it, it creates right. that. But then there's also these like small things that like the the um, little bad juju, the you know the, the the voodoo and the menstrual blood, and also this this really kind of stunning relationship that Darlene, who's on you know who's deep into the first relationship of Scotty and being and being beaten and carrying watermelons all day, et cetera, et cetera really forms a love relationship with the character Sirius B, who's this remarkable guy who knows the constellations and always wants to be a scientist. And, and then and it happens, and you see it happens, it happens very quickly. And, and then something else happens, and it goes away for a while, and then it shows up at the end of the book, and you're like, oh. No, I didn't, no it shows up as a, as a memory, as a memory, this thing that happened. I didn't say anything. Okay. <laughs> oh my goodness, it's hard to talk about fiction. <laughs> But you realize that they were in love, or, or I realized it. It's like, oh, like it, all this was happening, and then there was also within the context. Of, I mean, this sort of goes to the humor part, right? Like, and there's humor, and there's all these things, and there's the ability to fall in love uh, in these in this context. I was, I just, I just wanted to say, I was really moved by that. Um, oh, and then, yeah. Okay. Saying, yeah. Yeah, there were things that I was going to say in between the things that you said, but now I can. Can you just say all that again? Yeah, so uh, there's a spoiler, and then there's no spoiler, and then there's no spoiler. Yeah, I see that spoilers. Yeah. What was it about? Uh, it was before the thing about Series B, I think it was. Um, and, she's the, and she's dealing with the first relationship with right. Scotty, and she's at the farm, and. <laughs> well, I mean, that wasn't. I, Ish, I, I, guess. I guess. And then it disappears for a little while, I said. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's good for you to have gleaned that. Um, because I don't. I, it wasn't necessarily something that I was um, imagining to be that important. I mean, it is a, in, in a certain respect, it is true that, that that is what happens. Yeah, I think I'd bring it up because. Because in the days following, you know, like it's a big book, like I said, you, know, you, you enter it, it's a world, the characters are, are so um, compelling and their voices are so strong and sometimes their voices uh, change. Like there's this uh, scene um, in which Darlene sort of exits her um, online engagement with Scotty and sort of raises above it and sees it all and then her voice changes. Um, and all that is just so compelling. And then I was, in the days afterwards, I was really taken with those kinds of details, right? The things that are a little bit side and like, you know, the, this crazy scene where she comes upon someone doing, you know, this magic with her menstrual blood. Oh, right. And it's like not necessarily directly related to the main thing, but it's this incredibly vivid, well, crazy scene that sticks in your head. And so that, I guess this is my way of bringing up those kinds of things. That, I mean, this is one of those moments at which the, um, that is one of the things that was actually drawn from an account that, the original account that made me want to write this book. Oh. Apparently, one of the things they were doing, huh. I don't know, I don't even know why. It just doesn't even seem, it doesn't make any sense to me that they would feel the need to like perform like acts of voodoo on these people that they were already keeping on the farm with, but apparently that is actually what what this woman said that was happening huh. at this place. That they were doing all kinds of like magic with their menstrual blood to try to keep people on the farm. It was just like, but it also inspired me to move the whole thing to Louisiana because I felt like there was there was something in that idea of people putting curses on each other that I wanted to kind of take seriously. Um, and, and specifically, like the idea of discrimination and racism being a uh, a kind of curse that, even though everybody knows it doesn't it doesn't work and it's fake, right? But well, why does it why does it work? Right. <laughs> it's like yeah. a weird kind of magic. Yeah. That's one kind of body does on another kind of body, right? It's like 
Yeah. And yet, it's and it's in, it seems so intractable sometimes. It's amazing. But I wanted to explore that, it, like the, the idea of people putting curses on each other, in a way that was like embedded in the in the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it just it strikes me that this is probably also something that happened in slavery in the 1600s, you know, from the 1600s on as well, right? I wasn't there. <laughs> but just, I, was, I, I was just reading, I was reading Who's Your Mother, and she talks about all the soporifics and all these kind of herbs that people were mm -hmm. given to forget. Um, right. Probably some sort of spelling that goes along with using traditional things as well. As right, but the, but the white folks' magic works a lot better. <laughs> See, there's a, I mean, there's a passage yeah, 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 in the book yeah, yeah, that's yeah, something yeah. like, you know, if white people put a curse on you, then you're up to your eyeballs in like lawsuits and you know, stuff you can't get out of <laughs> um, But it's this, it's, you know, it's, it's similarly voodoo-like, except that it works. Yeah, 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 the law on your side. Yeah, and then, I mean, that's another thing about, you know, the, the fact that people can say these words that are like magic spells, that, you know, because everyone believes them, they have weight, right? I mean, the law is pretty much voodoo. Another part of it, uh, the magic that you talk about in the, in the NPR interview, the, the magic black who can do anything. And uh, Eddie, and the son, he op opens the book and he is kind of like magical because he, he's had this really hard life, but he can do anything. And he becomes a handyman. I won't say what kind of. Oh, no, you can. <laughs> that's that's um, a good spoiler. Uh, you know, he has no hands. He becomes a handyman without hands. So the book opens with Eddie driving a car without his hands chopped off. And he's the seven, he's 17 or so when he think he's yeah. right, six, seven, right? Yes. And um, and so he's this incredible character that goes through all this hardship and, and he's magical and can do anything. And then there's Darlene who goes through well, he's not, he's not he's not really magical. No. I was kind of more interested in subverting the idea of the magical negro. Because whenever you know, whenever that sort of trope comes up in a film or a, a you know a book or something. I'm always like, I want to follow this person's story. Like, I don't really want to hear about the, you know, people that get saved by this person. Like, this person has obviously been through some interesting, traumatic, whatever, right. that is not going to get explored in, you know, in a Hollywood kind of context, right? So I'm like, oh, maybe we can just turn the wheel and like go follow this person. And that's kind of one of the one of the reasons that Eddie is the character that he is. Well, I think um, the book, yeah, and I think the book does this, right? Like, there's the appearance, and then there's the story of how the appearance got to appear, right? right. So there's Eddie and Darlene, and mm -hmm. really, to, like, the story is told. Like, so, so when you see a documentary and you learn the documentary that prostitutes and crack addicts are easily, you know, picked up, you just see prostitutes and crack addicts, and so this is a story that says, wow, how does a person end up in this place in her life? And there's this story that makes sense, right. makes a certain amount of sense, or, um, and then you and then you tell this one story and you can imagine that's, that there's, that every single person has a story, has a history, has come from a place that's brought them here. But the, the, the other thing, that the, there's also this question of um, kind of strength of, but and, and um, circumstances of life, and strength of character. So, so there's this there's this question about Darlene the mother and Eddie the son and, and both of them have these really abject circumstances and there's kind of different results and so there's this question of strength and weakness of character and I one of my favorite things about the novel how it how it both raises that question and the question of Darlene's potential weakness and um, Eddie's potential strength and then subverts that as well right there's this I want to say how it subverts it but maybe you could talk about subverting the notion of strength and weakness of character. And, that problem. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure where to start with that. I mean, I think that, that it really has more to do with my desire to make characters feel more like human beings and less like ideas, right? And I feel like the way to do that for me, anyway, is to make them inconsistent, more or less, right? To, to find something about them that seems sort of, you know, elemental and then kind of turn it around in some way, or like show you a different side of what that character is supposed to be like. Um, or even have them, like Darlene, Darlene doesn't really ever seem to know, um, she doesn't really have any sort of ability to look at herself and what she's doing. And I feel like a lot of what 
where the book goes with her is that she ultimately begins to see herself in a way, and the, and the consequences of her actions on other people in a way that she had not ever seen them. Um, and I guess that, I mean, a lot of people are like that, too. I mean, a lot of people who are drug addicts, you know, but who, with, who've had, like, substance abuse problems have, have that issue as well. It was because I, I was watching a lot of intervention. Oh, was that, I was going to ask you that, because I think like, probably a lot of people ask you about <coughs> research with American slavery, but I, I actually found your research with drug addiction really, really compelling as well, so it's interesting. It's like, well, there was that. I mean, I've also known people who had substance abuse problems as well. Right, so sort of intimate friends, but also, yeah. I, yeah. There, there's something about it where, I mean, just the voice of Scotty is so, um, so strong and known that I think this is, this is an intimate relationship, either from research or from knowing people that, you know, that the, 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 the sort of the substance of your own knowledge was as clear in that as it was in, in the structure of how. Oh, yeah, I mean, I think that just kind of came together in a way that was not, <clears throat> it wasn't like formed already. It was kind of like I had this voice and I didn't know who it was. And I was just kind of enjoying writing it. And I decided at a certain point that Darlene was going to be a different kind of character than she started out. Um, but I still had this voice, which didn't really represent her in the way that it was supposed to initially. Darlene was supposed to be, it was kind of going to be like, you know, this is a very close third person on Darlene. And Darlene was maybe going to be a little bit closer in character and in personality to Scotty. But I decided to change that um, for various reasons. But I still wanted to write this, this voice. And so I ended up asking myself, well, who is actually speaking if, if it's not Darlene? And the answer came to me that it was the drug. And I mean, it's not as if there's no precedent for that, right? It's like, mm. you know, people people often say like, oh, it's the whiskey talking. Yeah. Right? Like, oh, yeah. You know, it wasn't me, it was the drugs. Um, but in this case, to literalize that, I mean, I've had conversations with people who were my friend who yeah, talking yeah, to yeah. the drug Absolutely. directly. I love in the piece that you just read how, um, the, the, that I, I picked it up as you were reading, that the, um, She's on. She's she's high. She's just got had this experience where she was so high that she had this fight, and um, and yet what she what ha what she imagines is all this food and this cornucopia, and so that, that even though a certain kind of desire is being fed by the drug, the drug also creates a sort of more intense hunger, also mm -hmm. for this other kind of fantasy of plenty. Right, but it's a fantasy. It's a fantasy of plenty that's quite familiar, right? It's also, you know, every time you walk into the produce aisle of a, yeah. know, of a supermarket, you see you know, the little misters go off and you're like, shh. It creates this like fantasy <laughs> land of beautiful vegetables or whatever. Huh, okay. by slaves, but, yeah. <laughs> but nevertheless, like, I mean, that, that was kind of the, you know, or they're like on television, constantly there's images of like, I mean, that last image of like the, whatever, the piece of celery snapping with all the, like, <laughs> You know, wetness flying off it is like it's, it's, yeah, such, it's, a, it's such a prepackaged image of like what um, your desire for sustenance is supposed to be. And so there's this sort of okay. So what, that's the, um, there's these television images and commercial images. I don't remember exactly what the commercial was when they the, when the farm is exposed and there's a expose on the TV and in between watching the TV expose there are these crazy commercials um, tell me what they are they're like for um, I don't know like things like um, you know fantastical getaways and things like this I don't, I, I'm not remembering exactly the commercials that are in the book um, but I was seeing like that landscape right between the, between the farm and the crimes and commercials and the, the crazy Disneyland that we're projecting that we live in in our malls and our highways are, are somehow brought really close together in the, in the book as and um, I don't know if you have anything to say about that but I think you just were well, I mean they are very close yeah. together yeah. I mean and, and, it's, and it's very strange that we try to separate them right, right. I mean, well I think that that's also the prison system does that too right there's actually a lot of Work now. There's a big article now that I was just reading about um, 
about the United States participating in prison labor um, for like call centers and things like that and selling that. I mean, we all know about this, but it's it. More free labor. Yeah, it's, so there's also that, and that, that's kind of slavery as well. And, yeah. and there's like, you know, the New York Times is getting on the how many black men are missing. Well, they're just missing. <laughs> yeah. We lost our, we we lost lost our black men. Has anyone yeah. seen our black men? We lost. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I have uh, one, one more sort of, uh, question that uh, I got a little uh, help from with James. But um, so one of the things that's amazing about uh, James's work is that it's not all biographical, right? And it, uh, or yeah, so there's a there's like some funny stuff. Not obviously. That, some funny stuff about you know, um, God says no. And here's this really overweight Christian guy, and people are. Like, are accusing James of being tremendously autobiographical, and so it's kind of like that. But um, so yeah, so one of the ways in which I was, uh, which I think it would be, it, it's there's autobiography of your biography, but there's also a kind of um, thinking autobiography that is in the book, right? And um, you you dedicate that there's a cover that is by Kara Walker, who's also a cousin of, of James's, and um, the book is dedicated to Kara and Clarence de McLeod. And um, you were saying that the, there's stuff all over the book that is Kara, and I was wondering if you could talk to us about that. Well, I mean, in a way, one of the reasons I dedicated it to her is because it felt to me a little bit like a conversation I wanted to have with her. I wanted to be like, hey, Kara, look at this. Um, have you heard about this? Because, you know, I've, yeah, I've sat with her work for such a long time. Like, you know, when she first started showing in New York, I was living in Silver, and she would come and stay with me when she was installing work. Um, and to some to some degree, I feel like a, the the methodology of the book is somewhat like drawing on her influence on me. To you know, I, I can't exactly say what it is. Some, there was a there was a reviewer who was saying something about you know the way in which I was using stereotypes, like taking a a person a kind of person that you would think you know oh a black woman who's a prostitute, right? Like we've heard about this all over the news or whatever, or you know, it's kind of a stereotype. But then I had taken these stereotypes and kind of shown some other side of them that people were not. But I think that's exactly what she does. And I hadn't really been consciously right. saying, like, I'm going to appropriate this idea and see if I can, you know, translate it to literature. But, um, right, and, and not a sort of, they say that getting behind the stereotype or the outline of the person, right. right it's, Often the way that that's approached is to say, really, a, a crap prostitute is a great person, <laughs> right? And so just like uh -huh. the way that uh -huh. she stays complicated, sexual, um, unreliable, reliable, loving, terrible, whatever. Yeah. Those things. I mean, yeah, to turn her into a person. Yeah. Instead of you right. know a statistic or you know that's that I think is a big part of my project as a as a writer. Um, yeah, and Eddie's sort of, yeah, Eddie also like the, the incredible violence that has happened to him that doesn't go away is right there. Like that people aren't that people aren't meant to what they don't sort they don't no one really overcomes anything. We just maybe heal sometimes a little bit or we um, make do. And yeah, that's and what you sort yeah. Of there's a very gradual. I mean, it's it's <laughs> there's a gradual grasping towards something. Hopefully, mm -hmm. right? right. But you, I feel like you can't really get it, all of that into a book, right. unless it's like 10 times as big. I did know, I, I did, uh, one of the questions I had was, um, there's there's many things that come up, you know, I'm drawing sort of a blank on um, specifics, but that um, not, not everybody would know, like, like, you know, blues musicians or, right, and you do a really subtle job of giving people just enough information, I thought, so that you don't have to go to Google. <laughs> right, I was, like, I was like, I didn't ever have to go to Google, but it wasn't like, I, you know, I felt like I was an expert, but I was yeah. like, you can keep reading. Yeah, but some of it's made up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, had, I had a little, the copy department kept asking me about all these things that I'd actually made up. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Sort of I, I, I didn't look them up in Google, so I'm trying to say. Yeah, I, I invented the names of some of the blues songs, but some others are actually real. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, but the thing I was, I was going to say about uh, the autobiographical part of it is that there's a lot of embedded family history. My grandfather has the same name 
as the bluesman that uh, um. Willie William Walker was his name. I never met him, but he's, so and there's just some, I mean I could I could I'm not going to go through. I mean I maybe I would I would I would call it abject and not necessarily grotesque. Um, I, I can't necessarily explain my fascination with things like this, other, other than to say that um, it seemed to me that this was an incredibly grotesque story when I heard about it as a true story, right? Like, the first time I heard about it, it was as a true, well, I mean, not, not the entire book, right? But the germ of it was that I read this account um, in John Bowe's book, Nobodies, um, which is a book that details a variety of um, uh, labor abuses around the world. Um, one of, and there's this one story about a woman named Joyce Grant, <coughs> who was a slave in Florida in 1992. Um, and when I heard that, you know, the top of my head flew off, and I was like, "What the fuck? What year is this even?" Um, it just sent my head spinning into all different kinds of like, "Well, okay, the same thing is happening to the same people, the same demographic, in the same place." Now, what is time anyway? <laughs> you know, and is there something eternal about our desire to abuse one another in this particular way? Is there something about, or is it something about our system that makes it so that, you know, or is there something about power in general? Because I think, you know, this is, you know, as much as it's a book about discrimination and racism or whatever, it's also a book about power. I mean, it couldn't not be a book about power and be, you know, and be about racism. I mean, I think it's fairly obvious. Um, <clears throat> but I mean, I, th I think that all of those things are, are the sort of grotesqueries that we kind of live with without recognizing how much we live with it. I mean, I'd love to know, for example, like how many pieces of clothing in this room were sewn by slaves. It's not something we can actually know in the moment, but it's something that I wonder about. Um, but I also feel that that's the way it works, right? It's like you're not supposed to know because, I mean, even companies that, that use slave labor sometimes are not aware that they might be doing it because they've subcontracted out to like several different companies, right? So if they don't know what's happening with company A, um, they're only dealing with company C, and company A is actually like the one that's enslaving people and doing all the horrible things. They can still, in all good conscience, say like, we're, we're not using slaves. You know? So, I mean, but I think there are lots of ways in which, you know, we, we live with things that we, um, that we would consider grotesque if we knew about them. Walmart. Yes. Um, I, when I read in one of the reviews, and when I heard you actually read last year, um, I was struck by the sort of the brilliance of using, as Rachel brought this up also, um, using the, uh, using crack cocaine as a narrator. Um, and you were talking about it now as, you know, it's, it's a colloquialism, right? You know, it's the drugs talking, it's the alcohol. Um, but it seems like this kind of liberalization of metaphor is, um, it's not, I mean, it's a really powerful thing, um, but it's not something, and in fact, it's so, it's so simultaneously brilliant and obvious that it amazes me that it isn't done more often. Um, and I wanted to know if, in fact, there are, um, when you said there are precedents for this, I thought you were about to give oh, uh, uh, a literary kind of genealogy <coughs> or a, a sort of quick survey of other novels or whatever that you know do the same thing. I know, but I, I, I'm drawing a blank. Well, the one I was thinking of um, that I think I, I credit with giving me a little bit of permission to, to make Scotty the narrator is um, Patricia Smith's book, uh, Blood Dazzler in which several of the poems are written from the point of view of Hurricane Katrina. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and that, I thought, was a, a particularly sort of bold, nasty move, right? Like, well, who, I mean, who really cares what the hurricane thinks, right? <laughs> like, because the hurricane is sort of our enemy. But to, to sort of get inside, you know, the, the perspective of 
of a really unusual entity like that seemed to me just so compelling. I don't remember that I remembered that when I made the decision to, to make Scotty um, one of the narrators, but that was, that was one of the things I was thinking about. But I, and I also remember hearing about, but never really being, being able to find it. It might have been some other person, but I think, I, I, I don't, I don't, maybe somebody knows about this, but that Kenzaburo Oe had written a book in which one of the perspectives is of a sort of overwhelming sadness. Mm. <laughs> I, d I don't know that that's a real thing, but it sounded to me like it was... Yeah, I know. I, I, so did I. <laughs> One thing I noticed about the having such a strong... Um, right, because it's, kind of, it's like Scott, Scott is kind of omniscient, is the, the omniscient narrator, in a sense, uh, but because it's also Scotty uh, and has a strong other thing going on, it, it, I found that it made the not Scotty narrator uh, there was a sort of striking contrast that you don't usually have in a book, right? Mm -hmm. You sort of sort of assume like, and the narrator, and the character, and the narrator, and the character. So you begin to think about, oh, what is the voice of this neutral, naturalistic, other thing? And uh, we talked a little bit about how you know I I, I I always assume it's like I think that most of us, or like that in 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 English language or in literature, that's also it has a kind of male dominant persona, right? So what would be the persona of a drug? Is it, and you're wondering, you've been accused of it being male. Well, right? I'm not and accused, but everybody tends to assume that Scotty is a male voice. Whereas I, I think, like, kind of like, interestingly, that actually takes it away from an, assum an assumed voice, right? That, yeah. that the other I mean, the narrator has. I mean, technically, you know, the term comes from Star Trek. Right. It's Scotty. like beam me up, yeah. Scotty is sort of what, mm -hmm. and then that became this um, uh, an yeah. actual slang term that crack addicts used to to describe crack. Right. It's a nickname they have for, for crack. Um, <clears throat> so in a in a way, it's like if if you followed that right. to its origin, you would say like it's that I don't remember the name of the actor who plays Scotty on, on Star Trek, but. Somebody has the IMDb, I'm sure. <laughs> um, Google. Yeah, I'm not as, I'm not a tricky. Uh, Other questions? Thank you. <coughs> I have a question. Um, yeah, first of all, not having read it yet, now I won't read it, but, uh, but I enjoy having this kind of delicious treat of the voice of the character, and to hear that in a literary context, you hear the voice of that person, an African American person, from that setting. It kind of like surprised me that it's still surprising, but uh, again, it's kind of like that's grotesque, right? But, but in but my question is um, that it seems like writing about that period in this age, particularly of the amne cultural amnesia, seems really important to highlight and to highlight the perceptions <coughs> about the present. Um, but I was also wondering if you have been, had any desires to write about the context from the present and to write, and if so, if so, what or why? Well, even though this obviously informs the present, how we see the present is, you know, we see it through the lens <coughs> of the past, we see our present. Right. I mean, it's not that far in the past, the events uh -huh. in the book. They, I mean, they go up to about 2000. Or something? Uh -huh. From 1970 something, 75. I think it's 74 to 2004 or something. Oh, it's 70. Yeah. So the, the computers change, <coughs> right? Yes. You, you know your yeah. technology. You know what year you're in now, based on the computer that people are using. Yeah, but there's also references to older computer models, mm -hmm. um, rather than like putting a sort of timestamp. On, on where things are in the book, I was tending to use sort of cultural markers like, you know, current events of the day that might have intruded somehow into the, into the narrative. How they're, they're supposed to work, or what is my feeling about using this? What, are, what were the sources for the dialogue? Oh, the sources. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's called Growing Up in Yonkers, New York. Yeah. Okay. I recently saw um, 
a woman who, uh, Auntie Fee is her name. She, um, <coughs> she does this sort of cooking show. She's from uh, South Central. And uh, her son films her doing this cooking show. And she sounds so much like Scotty. It's hilarious. And it reminded me, seeing that, how much I had picked up that voice from like listening to people in my neighborhood when I was growing up. And how, in a way, it was sort of like what, what I want the, for the book to do, in one sense, is to have you know, this other voice that seems, um, I wanted the voices to be equivalent in terms of what they were doing, right? right. Like, I didn't want to suggest that because this is a, is a vernacular African-American voice, that it can't do any of the same kinds of things that a literary voice is supposed to do, right? right. right? So, yeah, it's, yeah. It's but it's tricky to kind of make both of those things work at the same time, and you know, still have both things seem as authentic as one another. Right. Um, so it's the second part of my question. That's really great. That's Can I ask you something? Just one thing. Can I ask the second part of my question? Sure, sure, sure. Sure, it is. So I might forget. Is, um, is um, okay. So given that, at, at what level are these the dialects of the formerly enslaved African still enslaved? I mean, at what level are you looking at the formerly enslaved that we celebrate the abolition of slavery, so it's a line in the sand, suddenly you're free, you're a slave, now you're free, and yet what we're realizing more and more, and many of us have always realized, is that this is, uh, you know, it brings into question time, causality, different kinds of circular things, systems, networks that we're working in uh, that don't make this an easy transition. So in some ways, the dialects are registering slave dialects in a contemporary setting. Um, mm -hmm. That's what I'm getting from hearing you read today. OK, but what was the question, Martin? <laughs> well, maybe it's more of an observation, but the question is, was that your intention? Is this something that you're working with? Um, no, maybe not specifically, but I mean, I think it's just a byproduct of like it being derived. So you know, from those things that you're describing. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's evolved in lots of different ways. But I mean, every every week there's like a new thing that black folks are saying. Right. And I think like people themselves, right. Right? right? There's there's a speak that there's the way you speak in one context of your life, and that any one person has to be multiple. Like how like how do you leave one situation and then appear in another situation, and do you use the same kind of speech? Code switching. Right. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's very self consciously, yeah. deliberately code switching. And, and again, I haven't read the album yet. Just read the book. Okay. So I think I will really appreciate it. Seems like maybe one more question. Or a, I don't want to know what Stephen asked. I'm curious about your experience writing Darlene. Normally, if like a male um, is writing like a female sex worker's life, I would like my sisters would go off and be annoyed by that. But I haven't read it yet. But so far, what I've heard. I wasn't like bothered by it, and it seemed like you wrote it for well, but I was curious about that yeah. choice to do that and how it's not as relative of her situation. I think it's always different when a gay man writes about a prostitute. There's, I have no interest in making her a sex object. I have no interest in, I'm just interested in her humanity, right? So. I also, I also knew that I was treading in the exact territory that you're talking about, so I was like, okay, how can I make this interesting and real in a way that it, I've never seen it be interesting and real? And one of those ways was like, I decided that she was a really bad prostitute, like she wasn't any good at it, right? She didn't like it, she was doing it for a very specific reason. I, also, I actually was kind of like, because it was really, it was part of the, the story that I, it was often part of the stories that I read that were non-fictional. I felt that I should deal with it in some way. Um, and it, I was ambivalent about doing it in the first place. But I felt like, you know, just making her a real person, I mean, I think that's always the way to approach your characters, right? Just try to make them as real as possible. And, you know, and don't bullshit yourself about what they are, you know, what they're doing as opposed to who they are. And thank you, by the way.
Yeah, she's awesome. That's great. Right, I think that's perfect. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>